Alfa Romeo police cars. I haven't seen the Lamborghini police car yet. I've seen it on Google many, many times. The walk with meaning and also just sort of wandering continues. And I'm like, I've noticed this gated church. We're going to have to go in and have a look. As we enter the Basilica of St. Lawrence in Lucina, a sense of timeless serenity surrounds us. The cool, hushed atmosphere inside is a stark contrast to the bustling streets of Rome outside. Here we are stepping into the sacred place that dates back to the fourth century. This beautiful basilica, one of the earliest in Rome, began as a house church, established in the residence of noble matron Lucina, hence its name. It's a place where history and faith entwine seamlessly. Now as our eyes adjust to the dimmer light, the interior reveals its ancient Baroque elements in harmony. The nave lined with columns repurposed from Roman sites guides us towards the altar. And as we approach the main altar, this is where we can witness a masterpiece of Baroque art. It captured my attention, I'm wondering if it captures your attention just as much. This is Christ on the Cross by Guido Reni, a poignant portrayal of the crucifixion. It invites contemplation. Reni's use of light and shadow in this painting brings a lifelike depth to the scene. A true artistic genius. Each column, each marble tile underfoot is a fragment of history echoing the evolution of Christianity. Moving deeper into the basilica, the light from the high windows casts a soft glow on the walls adorned with art. Each piece, a visual narrative of devotion, speaks of the deep-rooted Christian heritage that this basilica embodies. As we look up in the modest yet dignified ceiling from the 17th century, a beautiful contrast to the grandeur often found in Roman churches. Now this is a testament to the enduring simplicity and the solemnity of faith. The serene atmosphere of the Basilica stays with us as a blend of history, art and faith. And now as we step outside, we find ourselves in the midst of Rome's vibrant energy once again. Yet right here, outside the Basilica, there's more history to explore. We're reminded of the ancient Roman history that engulfs this city. Every corner I step in this city, I'm blown away and I am in awe. Strange, it was frighteningly cold in that place. I could I could see my breath coming out of my mouth. It was that cold. I mean it's considerably warmer outside, but what drew me in were these ancient relics that we see here. All this in Latin. Probably preserved, probably found remarkable. One of the big things about Rome and all of the Italian cities is sort of cafe culture. The Italians sort of sat there in the squares or piazzas drinking their espressos or their cappuccinos as long as it's before 12. They get very irate if you order a cappuccino after 12. They think it's uh, sacrilege. And then he got really angry. So don't do that. A lot of uh, Russians tend to order cappuccinos after 12. I must break you. But Italians will not. Buongiorno, welcome back to where I walk around Rome. Today we try our best to see one of the most amazing buildings in all of Rome, the Pantheon. I assume these people are queuing for the Pantheon. What I didn't realize is they were queuing for this place called the Lennetikia Vinayo. It's a food place. It's a quick and easy place to get hams and quick food. So very, very popular. Scan the menu if you're curious. People basically come out with sandwiches. I mean, the meat looks good, but queuing for that long? Okay. I think it's something that people do, you know, when they see lots of people queuing, they go, oh, i got to try this, i got to try it. It's a sandwich at the end of the day. Everywhere I went, I had to stand in line. Now, this is more worthy of a person's time. As we approach this lively square, in front of us is the beautiful Pantheon. We're immediately enveloped in a landscape where history and present-day Rome converge. The Pantheon itself, with its monumental columns and a vast coffered dome, stands as a silent yet powerful witness to the centuries of history. Wow. I mean, this doesn't get more impressive than this. This would have been witnessed by Marcus Aurelius. This would have been taken in by Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius would have walked inside this, what is known as the Pantheon. And almost 1900 years later, this still remains and it's literally loved by people from all over the world. Let's go and have a look at it. We're not going to forget the random obelisks again. 
marked everywhere. The obelisk of Ramses II, an ancient Egyptian monument that adds an element of historical intrigue into the setting. This obelisk originally was from the Temple of Ra in Heliopolis and brought to Rome in ancient times. It stands elegantly connecting two great civilizations. Everyone now, you can see eating their sandwiches, I think got them from that place where they're all queuing. There's another place here. It's now lunchtime, so everyone's queuing. As we move through the square, every step weaves us deeper into the tapestry of time, bridging the gap between Rome's illustrious past and its vibrant present. Well, this is immensely frustrating. I think it's a relic of COVID. They're still basically trying to keep people to the minimum. So they basically you have to go on the QR code over here and you have to register. The sad thing is there's no availability until well, for two and a half hours. So, all because they haven't changed since the whole COVID debacle where they were restricting things. The British Museum was doing the same. I think it's time that they stop doing that. And then people aren't hanging around waiting and then you're not getting everyone's details. I don't want to hear the Name, address, phone number. Just in case we don't get to go into it today because of the lack of availability. So there's a lesson for you. Book in advance because the COVID restrictions are still in place. It's an immense, immense building. Very popular place. I just had a walking lunch. I got myself a slice of margarita pizza, a rice ball with mozzarella in the side, and a bottle of water, all for five euros. Super bargain. Rome is an affordable city. This is the Basilica of St. Andrea della Valle. Its inception dates back to the 16th century when the Theatine Order, founded by St. Cajetan, decided to build a church dedicated to St. Andrew, the Apostle. The construction, which started in 1591 under the direction of architect Ponzio Ponzini, reflects a fascinating blend of artistic and architectural influences. The church's grandeur and its striking dome, which dominates the Roman skyline, was largely the vision of architect Carlo Modano, a leading figure in the Baroque movement. The dome, completed after Modano's death, is second only to St. Peter's Basilica, its size symbolizing the church's significance in Rome's religious and architectural landscape. The interior is a spectacle of artistic brilliance, adorned with elaborate frescoes and sculptures that evoke a sense of awe and reverence. The main highlight is the fresco in the dome, painted by Giovanni Lanfranco, a prominent painter of the Baroque era. This breathtaking artwork depicts the Assumption of the Virgin, a theme that resonates with the Marian devotion deeply rooted in Roman Catholicism. The frescoes in the apse, created by Domicianino, another master of the Baroque period, illustrate the life of St. Andrew and are considered among his finest works. These artistic masterpieces not only enhance the church's spiritual ambience, but also serve as an enduring testament to the rich cultural heritage of the Baroque period. It is in this magnificent setting that the first act of Puccini's renowned opera, Tosca, is actually set. The church's depiction in Tosca adds a layer of dramatic allure, entwining the basilica's religious significance with its cultural and artistic resonance. This connection to the arts extends to the church's appeal beyond religious circles, attracting opera enthusiasts and art lovers alike, who come to experience a place where fiction and reality merge in a harmonious blend. Well, around every corner are these immense churches. This apparently has got the second highest dome in Rome. St. Andrea Basilica. Looks like I've stumbled across the Saturday market in Rome. It's into the southern side of the Pantheon. Smells of old wine. Vin Rule, as they say. It smells incredible, actually. It smells really, really good. There's an interesting statue over here. It almost looks like a chap from Assassin's Creed. Look at this guy. This is the Monumento al Giordano Bruno, right in the heart of Campo di Fari. It marks the site of a brutal execution. It serves as a powerful reminder of this man's profound impact on history. Giordano Bruno, born in 1548, 
was a Dominician friar, philosopher, and cosmological theorist, renowned for his groundbreaking theories that extended the Copernican model, suggesting that stars are distant suns surrounded by their own exoplanets, and theorizing in the 16th century of an infinite universe. His bold ideas, particularly as challenged the established Catholic doctrines, led to his execution in 1600, branding him a martyr for free thought. Today, his monument stands as a symbol of his advanced astronomical insights, but also an emblem of his enduring conflict between scientific exploration and the religious orthodoxy during the Renaissance. Anytime you eat at an Italian restaurant, they always offer you limoncello at the end of the meal. You want your limoncello. Many varieties of limoncello. I have to say, I'm not a fan of it, but my Italian friends love it. I don't like the taste. Taste some. I can taste some. I Where are you from? London. I was just, this is not lemoncello, this is orange cello. Meloncello. Maybe I like this one. If you can, if you can like it. Really? Alright, we're going to try meloncello for the first time. Pistachio. <laughs> well, do you add it to it? Hang on. A pistachio one. This is very generous of you. All right, we mix the pistachio with the, what have we got here? We've got the melon one, and we've got the pistachio one. Oh, you do that? Hmm? You do that? You do that? Yes, yeah. I'm trying to be. Limoncello, limoncello traditional room. You know the pistachio one's all right. The pistachio. Yeah, I've never had the pistachio. Yes, friend. No, it's fine. And we're really mixing these. <laughs> mix is good, bro. Yeah? All right, this is the original, yes? This is, I'm not sure I'm gonna like. All right, I'll try the original. I have also those beans. It's very generous. I don't want to take all your stock because I'm, I'm not, I'm not buying anything. But I, uh, how much is the general bottle so people know? How much? If you want. Yeah, how much do you sell them for? Uh, depend on for everything less price. Go on. Well, no, for the for everyone. How much do you sell? <laughs> Which one? What? This. No, no, no. I'm. This is our regular price, everyone. I said yeah. twenty-five euro. Wow. Okay. <laughs> if you want, I respect for <laughs> you. Because I didn't give it. All right. A too special price for you. I will just, I just, I just vlog it. Don't, I won't post it. But thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. No, no, thank you, thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a nice day. So I got to try the pistachio lemoncello, the melon lemoncello. I have to say the pistachio one's really good. If they have that in the future in restaurants, I'm going to order that. Do I feel guilty when they start chubbing this stuff down my throat and I'm not going to purchase the bottle? No. Most of the time people purchase it, just not me. No shame in that. We all did it. We just found ourselves in a square. Interesting bit of construction going on here, They're sort of retaining the imagery. Interesting. One thing I've noticed of walking through the streets of Rome, there's a lot of army people with these tents up. I'm not sure if the, today is a special reason or is it just always the case. They're always expecting to have checkpoints everywhere we go. But there's a lot of army checkpoints. So it turns out this is the French Embassy, but if you want to visit the French Embassy, you're going to have to book five, ten days in advance. I've just been lightly informed. They're obviously having some renovations in here, but from what I've heard, it's beautiful inside. But you may only go in if you have a guide. So if you want to visit the embassy, use the QR code here. There we go. And uh, you'll get past the checkpoints and you'll get to go inside the embassy. But only on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. If you're a weekend tourist here, you're not going to get to go to the French embassy. As you can see, Ukraine flag up there. Sadly, the European Union flag also. As we continue our afternoon stroll through beautiful Rome, I want to remind my subscribers and also new people watching this video that I have a membership and that membership helps support this channel, but it also gets you a postcard once a month. So if you'd like a postcard from whatever destination I find myself in, in that month, I will be able to send a postcard to you direct with my spider handwriting. You've got terrible handwriting. Now Italians love their bridges and Rome is no exception. Of course, we have the obligatory mini obelisk on this one. The obelisk. The obelisk is the key. This is the Emmanuel, I think the second bridge. 
beautiful bridge with statues overlooking this masterpiece over here. And we're going to walk around over here and then hopefully cut our way back into the centre of Rome. Look at this. There's something exceptional about the water in Italian rivers. Though. I quite like it. We're under the bridge. Really? <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> Beautiful day. The only negative about traveling in February gives you an idea when this video was filmed. The sun is continuously on the low horizon, at least if you're in the northern hemisphere. So constantly squinting on a beautiful day, but I can't complain. Because look, look at this, it's just fantastic. The point Vitaro Emmanuel II crosses the Tiber River, the main river that flows through Rome. It's a symbolic architectural tribute to Italy's unification and its first king, Vitaro Emmanuel II. Designed by Ennio de Rossi, its construction began in 1886 and culminated in the inauguration in 1911, coinciding with the Universal Exposition and the 50th anniversary of the Kingdom of Italy. This bridge is part of Rome's late 19th century urban renewal, aimed to modernise the city with new roads and new bridges, reflecting the national spirit of a newly unified Italy. Stretching 108 metres with three arches, the Point Vittorio Emmanuel II is not just a functional structure, but a symbol of Italian unity and progress, bridging the country's rich history with its modern aspirations. So far I've clocked up just under 20,000 steps on this little journey today and it doesn't get better. If you haven't watched part one and part two of this series, you can find those parts just by clicking on my channel, looking under Italy and you'll find them and be warned, there will be more videos on Rome in the upcoming future. So click that subscribe button and you won't miss a single one of them. So this is the Castle of St. Angelo. If you were to go in here, you'll see Renaissance paintings and collections of art from, well, different ages, but this is a second century castle. Probably ordered and built, not built, but certainly ordered at request of Marcus Aurelius, because he was born in the second century. Well, this castle, in fact, was built as Emperor Hadrian's mausoleum in 135 AD. That's three years before he died. It epitomizes the rich transformative history of Rome, as over the centuries, this monumental structure has evolved from a final resting place for Roman emperors like Hadrian, Pius after him, and then Aurelius after him to becoming a formidable medieval fortress, a papal residence, and even a prison during the Renaissance. Today it stands majestically on the banks of the Tiber. As I said earlier, it serves as a museum offering a glimpse into Rome's layered past, and it surprisingly once was the tallest building in Rome. As I was in the castle last time I was here, I'm not gonna go in this time. It costs about 15 euros to get in. Uh, for my advice is you book online by the official website, although sometimes you can just sort of walk up. Today I think they're allowing people to walk up and you get to explore inners and outers of the castle. You'll see a lot of cannonballs, you'll see a lot of paintings. You're an immensely beautiful castle, worthy of your time. It's one of those sort of standout places. I just wish I had more time in this city. The reason I'm here, I've got a bit of business meeting as of tomorrow. Oh business meeting and I thought well why not let's come in early and I'll take in a little bit of Rome and I'll take in this yeah why not I remember the first time I walked down this bridge I think I was 17 years old I was just 17 that's what happened oh, I was 17 I was 13 I was and it was a very hot and steamy evening and at the time I was very a bit smitten with a certain blonde girl when one is smitten <laughs> those are the details we came from this direction and we walked up here and we just sort of gobsmacked as we stumbled across this castle at the time we were walking with no real clear objective way before smartphones and way before referring to maps constantly a long time ago we just sort of aimlessly got here and when we got here it was quite magical it was a standout moments and anytime i see this i'm always reminded of just 
Well, I don't remind of anything. I just, every time I'm here, I appreciate it. It really is a wonderful place. Point Saint Angelo was originally completed in 134 AD by Emperor Hadrian and initially known as the Allian Bridge or Pons Alias. It elegantly arches over the Tiber River. This architectural masterpiece was designed to serve as a grand approach to Hadrian's mausoleum which we just saw, symbolising direct connection between the Emperor's final resting place and the heart of ancient Rome. In the 17th century, the bridge underwent a remarkable transformation with the addition of 10 angel statues by the master sculptor Bernini and his students, each depicting scenes from the Passion of Christ. These statues not only enhance the bridge's aesthetic appeal, but also infuse it with a deep spiritual significance. Historically, Point St. Angelo was an essential route for pilgrims travelling to St. Peter's Basilica, underscoring its religious importance in the city's fabric. Today it stands against the backdrop of Rome's ever-evolving skyline. The bridge is not just a conduit for movement, but a testament to the city's layered history. It symbolises the interplay of art, architecture and spirituality, making it a poignant reminder of Rome's enduring legacy as the centre of cultural and historical gravity. Oh, uh, Italian city would be complete without the obligatory Ferrari. I've decided I'm going to head back to the Pantheon. But before I do, I had to point out another, another obelisk. This is one of my favourite uh, piazzas, but it is. I just didn't realise how many obelisks there were in, in Rome. I wouldn't be in Italy if I didn't have Italian ice cream. Pistachio. Better than the pistachio limoncello, but really good. First element. That's it. We're starting about the pants. We have four minutes. I got myself a ticket. I'm just about to go into probably one of the most inspiring, influential buildings that the world has ever seen. You think about all the buildings the Pantheon has inspired. Well, you'll come to realize this if you've never seen inside, but let's go inside and, and see how inspiring this building is. What you'll notice about the Pantheon is the typical Roman columns, these are all one pieces. These columns were shipped in originally from Egypt, which is probably one of the reasons we've seen so many obelisks in Rome, the fact that Egypt had a massive influence on the Romans. They wanted to outdo it, and then they've got this first section, and then we've got these massive iron doors, They're hugely immense, and you go in, and then it basically cuts to become this circular, monumental, impressive building. You can see how it's a square and then it becomes circular. And the reason there's a hole in the scene is because to make a dome, you would stack, I don't know if you ever built, I try to build a roof out of Lego. It's the same sort of concept. You stack them on each other and it's stacking around and each one as you layer it, it gets smaller and smaller right until we get right to the top. Sometimes uh, there's a part of the year where they drop rose petals through the dome and this whole area was filled with rose petals. And then there's other parts of the year, you know, the, the longest day of the year. You see where the sun is right now, simply because, you know, we're back, we're in February. But on the longest day of the year, midday, the sun will basically shine right down. Very, really impressive. And there's other parts of the day. The birth of Rome, I think, is something like April 20-something. You have to forgive me. The sun sort of penetrates through this angle and it basically goes, pours through the doors. So it's sort of like, as you're all entering the building, you're being blasted by sunshine at a certain time in the morning and, and then you enter. It's a phenomenally well thought out building. And then, Obviously, it wasn't always a religious place. It was turned into a religious place. Originally, it was built for Hadrian. Hadrian, the man responsible for Hadrian's wall, you know, up in the 
north of England that divides England and Scotland, kept the savages of Scotland out. He also had this built, and then once this was built, his time would have passed, and then Marcus Aurelius would have come in here. And then it was a later emperor, many, many lines down, that effectively then passed this down to the church. I think from maybe the, this was built around 120 AD, and around about 600 it was then changed into a church. And what an amazing church it is, you can still see. But it would have been more glamorous back in the Roman days. A lot of it's faded in this period of time. You'll see up here the eagle. The eagle is the symbol of a Roman god, Jupiter. Uh, eagles associate with the Roman god, Jupiter. On this site, there was actually another pantheon way back in the day, originally commissioned by Marcus Agrippa, but it was destroyed sadly under the reign of Emperor Titus in 80 AD. They tried to repair it, but another fire broke out in AD 110 under the reign of Emperor Trajan. It was later when Emperor Hadrian decided to rebuild the Pantheon which we see today. The work started in 118 and it was finished in 125. Architecturally, the Pantheon is the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world. The design has inspired countless architects since this beautiful building first appeared on the world. The Pantheon is also notable for being one of the best preserved of all ancient Roman buildings, largely because it has been in continuous use throughout its history. As I mentioned previously, in the 7th century it was converted into a church which was dedicated to St Mary and the Martyrs, but informally known as Santa Maria Rotunda. This continuous use has contributed significantly to its preservation. This is not the first time I've visited the Pantheon, and it certainly won't be the last time. Every time I've come here, I've just stood in awe and gawked up with total wonder. One at the construction and the dedication to build something as beautiful as this, but also I'm constantly mesmerized by the wonderful people that have passed through this place. The Romans have really left an impact on our history, on our timeline, and I love the fact that they are still inspiring today. I urge you, if you visit Rome, you must visit the Pantheon. It offers a tangible connection to the ancient world, inviting reflection on a legacy of one of history's greatest civilizations, that of the Romans, and that of some of the world's greatest ever emperors and thinkers. Truly mesmerizing. And as you exit the building, you appreciate the three different segments from the round to the square to the rectangle. I think there are two, the two rectangles, but it's phenomenally impressive. They really don't make buildings that much anymore, do they? And they're out to the hustle and bustle. They really didn't need these COVID measures, I think. I think it's, they should allow the people in and, oh well. We got there, we got in, we got in. Anyway, if you like this content and you like to watch more on Rome or any other place that I've traveled to, click that subscribe button, click that like button. Hopefully I will see you in the next video.